started a series through the Old Testament book of Judges that we've called Unlikely Saviors. And um, we gave you a little bit of an introduction through, uh, uh, about the history surrounding the book and uh, some of what we have looked forward to. And, and that message we called uh, An Unfinished Conquest. Uh, and um, today we're going to read chapter 2. And, and chapter 2 is sort of a summary of the book. And so this, uh, I was thinking, and I, I knew last week that this week's summer may be very similar, and, but um, I've decided to call this message today, Consequences of Disobedience. Consequences of Disobedience. And I'm not going to read the text today. We're going to read, we're going to do all of, of chapter 2 to all the different um, verses, as like, kind of like we did last week as we work our way through the text, but we're going to go on down, and um, what I want to do is just have a word of prayer, and uh, we probably need to do that right now, <laughs> but um, let's, uh, let's just bow our heads and let's, let's pray together. Our Father and our God, Lord, we do uh, just bow before you this morning, and um, God, we're thankful for this word of truth, and God, we pray that um, as we try to um, deliver this message today, God, that you would speak through us. And uh, God, that uh, these people would hear the word that you have for them today. And uh, so God, just um, just help us today, Lord, to uh, honor you in everything that, uh, that we need to do here this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it, it's this. Basically, when I, when I was a youngster, I was tasked with cutting our grass. And... Um, I started cutting, mowing our, our grass. I don't even know how young I was. I remember pushing a pushing a push mower like this. But, but my mom and dad both worked, and my dad worked away from home a lot uh, and uh, through the week. And uh, we had a riding mower. And as long as you know I was using the riding mower, it was pretty fun actually. But um, when I had to push, it was a little bit more like work. We, I had quite a bit to mow. But, but like I said, usually I would do this while my mom and dad were. Um, at work, I'm sorry, and um, so I would, um, you know, try to get it done. And you know how it is when you're your teenager. I, I, I don't know how old I was when I was this uh, when I was when this happened, but I was probably a teenager, maybe maybe 12, 13, somewhere around there, maybe a little older. I can't remember, but but um, I, it it had gotten to the point where in one week, I guess I had been told to cut the grass, and I didn't do it one day. And then the next day, uh, you know, my mom came home. I, I, it seemed like I remember Dad was there, but I don't know for sure because I'm so scarred. I, my memories may not be exactly right. But, but uh, and I don't know how many days it was, but finally, finally, my, uh, <clears throat> my mom came home one day, and, and she said, she says, all right, you don't want to cut the grass? She said, um, then this is what we're going to do. And she handed me a pair of scissors. And uh, she also handed my sister a pair of scissors, which I never did really understand why Amber was involved in this punishment because she never did mow the yard anyway. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, and so we, we got down on the, on the ground right outside our porch and started cutting the grass with these little bitty scissors. And uh, it seemed like an eternity, but finally, I know I started getting blisters on my hands, and I guess she had a little bit of compassion, and she relieved us of that work. And um, and I went to mowing the grass after that. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, once that happened, the yard got mowed. And after that, I never neglected to mow the yard again. And uh, and so some of y'all probably have some similar stories. But but there were cons consequences of disobedience in our household. And uh, I want I want you to understand that there are consequences for disobedience in the household of God as well. And I think we see that as we examine our passage today, uh, when we look in chapter 2. It starts out um, in chapter 2, it says, with a vision, or excuse me, a visit from the angel of the Lord. Look at verse 1 with me. It says, then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim. And there's some significance there, but I, I'm not going to talk about those two locations, but Look, what he, look, look at this phrase, angel of the Lord. This phrase uh, appears frequently in Scripture. And 
the word angel in both Greek and Hebrew, if you translate it directly, it really just means messenger. And so anybody, you, you could send an angel out in that sense, a messenger on your behalf. But, but here it's an angel of the Lord, and all caps Lord, so that's Yahweh, the great I am. And a lot of times in Scripture, sometimes the, these messengers are from heaven. And so when we think of angels, of course, our idea of what angels are like doesn't really come from the Bible. Uh, and so you do a little study on that. But, but, uh, and sometimes they may be simply human messengers of God. But here in this text, what we have is, I believe it is a pre-incarnate visit of the Son of God. And so when you look at this, you may say, well, how in the world, would, why, why, how do you know? Why would you think that? Well, I'm glad you asked because I want to show you. I want you to look in verse 1, and I want you to pay attention to what this angel says. Uh, he emphasizes in the first person, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Now, who did all those things? God did all those things. And so that's why I believe this is a pre-incarnate visit of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, you know, uh, this is what is often called, you may hear this word, it's a theophany. And that, that's an appearance of God. And sometimes it's called a Christophany, which that's an appearance of Christ. And we see these ha things happen in the Old Testament. And I listened to one message uh, where this, that's all the guy was doing, was talking about all these Christophanies or theophanies that are in the Old Testament and, and or what could be theophanies. But, but this is basically a Christophany is an appearance of Christ before his birth. And so don't be confused. You see, uh, Jesus didn't come into existence at the Immaculate Conception. And he, didn't, he didn't begin when he was born in Bethlehem. The Son of God is eternal. He's an eternal part of the triune Godhead. Father, Son, and Spirit. He always has been, He is now, and He forever will be God. That's who came to visit. And so uh, uh, that, that's what I want you to understand this morning. Um, and so we see this pre-incarnate visit of, of Christ and if you remember, let's see. So, well, first of all, let's just talk about this for a minute. Here in chapter 2, in verse 2, uh, we see this promise. And you see, he's reminded them of all that he did. He brought them out of Egypt. He brought them to the promised land, and he makes this for eternal covenant with them. And in verse 2, he reminds them that they were not to make covenants of the people in the land of Canaan. God wanted them to tear down the altars. But look what he says, but you have not obeyed my voice. And then he asked this question, why have you done this? Why have you not obeyed? Why have you disobeyed me? Why have you not done what I ask? And if you were here last week, then you'll probably remember the emphasis on the disobedience where you know, they were partially obedient. They, they, they did a lot of what God said, but they didn't carry through with everything that God told them to do in totally displacing these people who worship these false gods and these idols. And that's why I called the message today Consequences of Disobedience. Because we see here some of the consequences that happen to Israel because of their disobedience. And I want you to understand today, this is the main point, there are always consequences for sin. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And uh, so there are always consequences for sin. And, uh, and so this is what we see here this morning. And, and that's the message I want you to understand today. And, and you know that, that we are all sinners, aren't we? We're all sinners and we're separated from God. And, and maybe you understand the consequences of disobedience. I think we all do somewhat to different, different extents and different things that, that we've experienced. But today, what I want to do with you is I want to share just a few consequences for sin that we see in our text today. And the first one is this. Disobedience to God leads you to a difficult place. Disobedience to God leads you to a difficult place. 
I guess disobedience to anybody can lead you to a difficult place. But dif- di- disobedience to God definitely leads you to a difficult place. And um, look in verse 3 with me. He says, Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and they shall, their, shall, their gods shall be a snare to you. And notice how God says he will, he'll not drive the people out for them. You know, and God had promised he's going to give them this land. And, he, he, and God was doing a lot of these things miraculously. The walls of Jericho that fell. And, and, and even there, they didn't, they didn't completely wipe out all, all the people there. But, but, but this idea of thorns in their side, this, this is um, not really in the text. It's sort of uh, implied. And in most of your translations, if it says thorns, it's probably in italics to try to kind of help you understand what the text means and he's talking about there's going to be a continuing snare spiritually for them and see God got it's a metaphor and God, God wanted them to rid themselves uh, of all the people in the land who were worshiping idols and, and idolatry and all the evil things that they were doing and now as Joshua died they're at a place where they've come to terms with these idolaters and they've agreed, many of them we saw last week, to impose a tax upon them to allow them to stay in that land. And because of that, they'll always have spiritual difficulty in that place. Their disobedience led them to a difficult life. A difficult life. They found themselves in a difficult place. And so in verse 4 we see, So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. And then they called the name of that place Bochim and they sacrificed to the Lord there. And so in, in these two verses we see at least some outward manifestation of repentance. Uh, the Lord is punishing them, and and He's called them out, and and um, you know, uh, and there's weeping and there's sacrifice. <coughs> but you know, just because there's weeping doesn't mean the repentance is authentic. Did you know that? And just because there's some evidence of repentance doesn't mean that there's real repentance. And it's usually found out, you know, and we see. Uh, you know, people walk away from the church and they walk away from their life as a Christian and you, and you never see them doing anything for the cause of Christ. And, uh, you know, I think scripturally I can say with authority that that shows no signs of real repentance. And so, and that's kind of what we see with a lot of these people in, in our text and in our stories as we read through this, you know, uh, they didn't want God's punishment, uh, you know, and so they cried out to God for, for relief, and God relieves them, but then they just go right back to the way things were. And, um, you know, that happens to a lot of us. We, we don't want God's punishment, but, we, but, but, but real repentance and love for God our Savior never manifests itself in loving obedience. Not loving because you have to, but loving because you want to. Living for Jesus because you want to. You want to please Him because He loves you and He's blessed you. And so nevertheless, you know, what we see is that disobeying God leads us to a place of difficulty that we often wish we'd never found. And some of us know exactly what that's about. And in verse 6 it says, Then Joshua dismissed the people, the children of Israel, went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. And this is before the, the death of Joshua, we, we, we see in, in, here in verse 6. It's before, we saw last week, the, chapter 1 starts out with uh, the death of Joshua. And now here, here he's, he's kind of catching us up and he's describing things uh, of what they were like before Joshua died and, and, and after Joshua died. And so everybody went to their own allotted lands to possess them and they lived there, a lot of them, among the Canaanites. And all the people of that land. Disobedience will lead you to a difficult place. Disobedience is costly. And I remember, I, I was trying to think of a good story to tell you guys. And uh, I'm pretty sure I've told this before, but it's been quite a few years ago. But when I was a youth pastor back in my younger days, I, I took our youth to a Christian music festival at Six Flags Over Georgia. I believe it was called Atlanta Fest. And I don't know if they still do that or not, but it, it was it was it was an awesome week. It was all week, and 
And um, we had early access to the park every day. So an hour before most people came in, we got to go into the park, which that was the best part for me. Uh, I just loved that. But, but um, And then in the evenings, and I don't remember what time it started, but they would have Christian bands and uh, they would have preachers and, you know, I think a couple of preachers each night and lots and lots of bands. And the later it got into the night, the harder type of music it was. And it usually stopped about 1 a.m., and by then, I was already asleep. But, uh, but, um, but anyway, the Batman ride, the, the, the roller coaster at Six Flags Over Georgia was brand new that year. It was first year. So, you know, the line would get backed up really quickly. So as soon as they unlocked the gate, we'd be standing there waiting on them. And me and some of the guys in the youth group, we would run as fast as we could to the Batman ride. And there was a few times we were the first ones on, you know. And then as soon as we got off, we would run out and run back in. And when you're running out, you see all these stalls like this, you know, and they're empty. And so what we did, and I don't remember what day this was. I'm pretty sure we got away with it a few times. But, but, but uh, all I know is we, I jumped over the rail. Of course, all of them followed me. And we started back up. And about the time we got up to get back on the ride, I felt somebody grab me and pull me to the side. And they said, y'all cut line. Y'all can't ride. And we were banished from the Batman ride <laughs> for the rest of the day. I'm just thankful they didn't do it for the rest of the week. I, I, you know, but uh, but uh, I would have thought it'd been okay since I wasn't really stopping anybody, you know. But but uh, consequences for disobedience. I guess we were supposed to run all the way back out, but. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 and 16, it says, But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed you will be in the city, and cursed you will be in the country. Folks, you've probably heard this before. I want to tell you, sin will take you places you never wanted to go. It'll keep you there longer than you wanted to stay, and it'll make you pay far more than you ever intended to pay. Disobedience to God leads you to a difficult place. Another consequence of disobedience is this. Disobedience to God lead your children astray. Now, I want you to note this this morning. I want you to look at verse 16, I mean, excuse me, verse 10 with me. In verse 10 it says, When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which He had done for Israel. You see, there, here's a rise of a new generation. And it's, it, most likely, I guess, if you try to figure timelines, it would have probably been the grandchildren of those who exited e Egypt with Moses. And it says, this generation did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. <laughs> I mean, I, it's unfathomable, really. When you think just a couple generations removed, from this miraculous work of God, this generation did not know the Lord. It's, it's, it's scary. It's scary when you think about it. And, and, you know, and surely, surely, you know, they had heard the stories of the plagues in Egypt. And, you know, didn't they observe Passover and, and retell the story those 40 years in the wilderness? Surely they did. Uh, they had to have heard about the parting of the Red Sea. Could the grandchildren have not known about that? I say there's no way. There's no way they could not have known. And how the, 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 the Israelites passed on dry ground and how then at just the right moment the waters were released and Pharaoh's armies were drowned. What a coincidence. <laughs> 
How could they live with their parents and grandparents and not know about the manna and the quail and the water from the rock? And, and some of them may have even probably witnessed the, the, the dry ground in the Jordan when it split and allowed them to cross. Some of them probably even experienced that. And they would have known about the miraculous victories that they did have over the Canaanites and saw the hand of God at work. They would have saw the tablets of stone that God gave to Moses and, and so much more. And, but, and, but this text is claiming that they didn't know the Lord. Now, the word know here is the same word that, that uh, is used a lot of times to, de to describe, and I'll just say it like this, just like the Bible does, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and they had a son. And so there's some intimacy involved here, you understand? It's not, you see, they would have known here about all those things, and that wasn't the problem. The problem was they didn't know God here. They didn't, they didn't know the Lord personally. They didn't have a relationship with God like their parents or grandparents had had. And so they knew about God, but they did not know God. And I've heard it said so many times that a lot of people miss heaven by 18 inches. Do you know how you can miss heaven by 18 inches? That's the difference between your head, the distance between most people from your head to your heart. And that's the difference. A lot of people know about God, but they don't know God. Folks, you have to know God to experience His loving forgiveness. And so, it's the, this is, you know, we've got to understand, and you've heard this, Christianity is one generation away from extinction. And I've said this, and we've had messages recently where we've emphasized the fact that if you don't win your children to Jesus, who's going to? And who's going to win their children? Now, you can't make them come to Jesus. <laughs> and at least they, I think they knew about God. But, oh, how do they get to know God? Well, if you have a close relationship with him, he'll be in your house. He'll be in your actions. He'll be around. And that's how they get to know him. But this generation had been led astray by their parents and grandparents who I believe must have let the culture of the Canaanites infect their households. And they added the pantheon of the, the gods of the Canaanites to their worship and they compromised their worship and, and a lot of times they would say they're worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob but they'd make an idol to worship him by but God said no, no, no you don't do that you don't do that but we get an idea of how bad how badly they were led astray when we continue reading. Re start with me at verse 11. It says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreth. And so here we see just how far this generation had gone astray. They worshipped the gods of the Canaanites. Baal was the male deity that was worshipped throughout the land of Canaan. Now, there were different tribes in different areas that worshipped Baal in different ways. And so that's the reason there's the plural Baals here and the asterisk because but there, there's... Bel Hazor and, and Bel Hermon and Bel Heon and Bel Peor and Bel Perazim and Bel Shalisha and Bel Tamar and Bel Zephon and the one that a lot of you are familiar with is Bel Zebub. Remember, Jesus was accused of working under the power of Bel Zebub, who's the Lord of the Flies. You see, idolatry is always involves multiple gods because the worshipers 
uh, can never really be sure any one of the particular gods they cry out to them uh, uh, answer them because they're not real. And so they worship multiple gods. And then Ashtoreths, that's the equivalent female deity uh, representing earth and the goddess of fertility. And, and so their worship really involves survival and economics and agriculture. It's an agrarian society. And so their livelihood depended on good harvest. And so the aim of their religion was to produce fertility by means of um, magic and incantations and, and all kinds of potions and, and stuff like that and um, a lot of immoral acts in the name of their gods. And so this is what they did. And so that's the reason there's male and female gods. And, and all, all false religion has, uh, are, are really are based on the works of, of, of men and on what the worshiper does and you know and so it's all based on what you give or, or, or what you do or what you achieve to uh, persuade this deity to bless you. Every religion in the world is like that except for, for uh, the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says come as you are. He will forgive you. And so the concept of grace in these uh, idol worshipers is completely absent. They wouldn't have any understanding of how a God would be a graceful, merciful, compassionate, and loving God. It didn't exist among their gods. But Canaanite religion involved ritual prostitution. It involved child sacrifice. It involved mutilations in order to persuade these deities to grant fertility to both man and beasts and to crops. That's what they did. How far had they fallen from the instruction God gave them through Moses? Hmm. Now, you might say, well, we don't worship bells. No, probably not many statues of bells in our homes. But in many ways, we are guilty of idolatry by placing an emphasis and the importance of our lives upon Things like our work or our pleasure or even the, the sacrifice of our, of our own children through abortion. And, and so we're not as much different from them as you would think. Just think about the things in your own life that you put time and time again above your love and devotion to the Lord your God. That's idolatry. That's idolatry. And look at verse 14. He says, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so they could no longer stand before their enemies. Now in verse 14, we, we see the consequences of their disobedience in the Lord's anger. And the place where they found themselves, and it, it, it definitely, definitely wasn't where they wanted to be. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to understand that your disobedience doesn't just lead you astray, it'll lead your children astray. A generation who did not know the Lord. The way you live your life affects those who are watching you and how they live their life. A mother took her young son shopping and after a whole day in the mall going from store to store, uh, finally a clerk handed a little boy a lollipop and uh, the mother said, what do you say? And the little boy said, charge it. So you see, monkey see, monkey do, right? They're watching, they're listening and what you do affects them. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Now, idolaters are fools, and so we need not be idolaters. D don't live a foolish life that leads your children to destruction. Disobedience leads you to a difficult place, and it'll lead you 
leads your children astray. One other consequence of disobedience, and we'll finish up this morning. And that is, disobedience leaves you in need of a Savior. Now here we see this cycle of the judges kind of uh, laid out. Uh, let's read the rest of this text with, with me. Whenever they went, wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. And they turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked and obeying the commandments of the Lord. And they did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they revered, uh, excuse me, reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers and has not heeded my voice, I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died, so that through them I may test Israel whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them in the hand of Joshua. So in these final verses of chapter 2, we see this cycle of the judges. And, and he's, he's laying that out for us. That's how we know what's, what's happening. And then we work through the rest of the book and we see this cycle. And, and so it's the, a preview of the next 400 years or so, 380 years or so of the life of Israel with no clear leader. And uh, generation after generation was led away from the Lord. And it, and, it, and it appears that the Lord himself showed them compassion time and time and time again by delivering his people from oppression through an anointed judge, an unlikely savior, if you will. And, and they would show a time of obedience then, followed by a time of rebellion where they would worship idols only to find themselves in deep distress again. And so we see that cycle of judges that I showed you guys last week and and uh, uh, we see that image there that kind of helps us understand that. But, but we see this phrase, and we'll see it as we work our way through Judges. The Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered, plundered them. We see that in verses 16 and verse 18. And, and these are those unlikely saviors that, that we're talking about as we work our way through. And, 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 and you, know, you, you don't read anything about the Lord being motivated by their repentance or by anything they do to deliver them, what you see instead is a compassionate God full of mercy and grace who woos His people through His loving acts of mercy. And He sent judges because He loves people and He desires for their love and devotion to be to Him. That's what he wants. And it's in these acts of mercy that, that God revealed to his people how much they need him. And they need him to intervene for them. How much they need him to save them. You get the picture? <laughs> like us. They were completely incapable of saving themselves. Because they were Natural born sinners, separated from God, incapable of loving God on their own or pleasing God through their own efforts. They needed a Savior. Time and time again, they needed a Savior. <laughs> and so God sent these unlikely saviors 
to deliver them from their oppression and their enemies, their idolatry. In 1981, a Minnesota radio station responded to a story about a stolen car. It was uh, happening in California. And police were, were staging an intense search for this vehicle and the driver. You know, even to the point of placing announcements on local radio stations to contact the thief. They were trying to contact this, get a message to this thief. Because on the front seat of that stolen car seat, was a box of crackers that unknown to that thief had been laced with poison by the owner because of a rat infestation. The car, you know, and so now the police and the owner of this Volkswagen bug, <laughs> they were more interested in apprehending the thief to save his life than to, to recover the car. And so often, we find ourselves in a similar place when we run from God. We feel we need to escape his punishment. But what we're actually doing a lot of times is trying to exclude his rescue or elude it. In Romans 3.23, the Bible says that we've all sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners and incapable of saving ourselves. And so we need a Savior. Israel needed a Savior time and time and time again. So God sent these unlikely saviors in the form of these judges. These military heroes who delivered them from their oppressors. But the problem was that that salvation was just temporary. It was just for a little time. And then again, they would find themselves enslaved because of their disobedience. So then God would send another Savior. But I want you to understand something. All this points to one Savior that God would send. To bring us out of our idolatry and our enslavement and oppression. Who would save us forever. In Romans 5, chapter 8, it says... Excuse me, Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, it says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we will be saved from wrath through Him. Praise God for that. God loved us and showed us His love by sending His only Son to die in our place, to de deliver us from sin once for all and forever. And to all he, who believe in him, the Bible says he gave them to, the right to become the children of God and to share an, an, an eternal inheritance with the Lord Jesus. Eternal inheritance, amen? <laughs> so folks, there are consequences for disobedience. Some of you this morning are probably struggling to live for Jesus. And you say, Pastor Derek, I know I've been saved and I'm his. But you know your obedience is lacking. And, and you're holding on too hard to the life you used to have. You're letting the influence of the world have too much control over who you are and what you do. It's time to let it go. And to give it all to Jesus. It's time to get rid of it. Get that idolatry out of your life. Give it all to Jesus. Because I'm here today, maybe you're still lost in your sin. And, and you're in danger of spending eternity apart from God in hell forever. That's the ultimate danger. But you don't have to. God made a way for you to escape that punishment and be delivered in you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. And you can escape the consequences of sin forever. Will you do that this morning? We all come to Jesus. Will you get rid of those things in your life that don't honor God and obey God? Let's do that this morning. Let's bow our heads. Let's respond in faith. Father, we bow before you this morning.
God, we give you this time. We give you this invitation. God, be glorified in it. Lord, draw all those who will to come to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's